Hello, Kai Sudeep. I'm hoping to be accompanied by uh, more than one, but that doesn't take away from my uh, happiness to have you here. Um, do I have to have my video on? Um, you do not. You just have your name. Okay. Do I have to have it on, though, my video? Oh, no, no, you don't. Okay. Yeah, most people don't, actually. Most people have it the way you have it. Uh, and what's important is that I have your name and that you're here. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and begin. Okay. okay. Uh, so uh, with this, we are um, notice that you have your study guide, and so every assignment we do, almost every section that we do, uh, pertains to a question on your your upcoming test, and this this is no different. Um, hopefully, you had time to look at the sample and um, see how I responded to it. So this is my response right here. So notice, right, my analysis was um, what I have to be the thesis of what I read, uh, a couple examples of how that thesis was defended, and um, that's about it uh, for the analysis part. And then the evaluation, you just show me whether or not you thought it was credible and why. So notice I play devil's advocate in my evaluation, and I have a problem with the thesis, all right? So uh, if you had a chance to read it, you'd see that um, I did kind of the granted bud approach uh, in that I granted uh, conceded to the opposition that there are uh, scientific methods of inferring uh, things about the past, right? Like inductive reasoning, you find a fact here, what, what you believe to be a fact and another fact, and you, uh, you connect the dots logically. Uh, that's about the best we can do. Uh, because there is a scarcity of written resources um, about the Native Americans here in present-day U.S. Uh, Mesoamerica, they had the stelae, uh, the big stones with the hieroglyphic writings, and those mostly entailed uh, top-down political history. Uh, you had the um, codices, which were uh, literally books by the Maya and the Aztec, and they spoke about their culture, uh, all kinds of stuff. So they're very, very helpful. Uh, and ascertaining like stuff about about them and about their history. Uh, we don't have that luxury uh, here in U.S. territory. We have little like round counts on a hide, and that'll just show us maybe up to about 10 years, and it's just a one major event of that entire year. Um, and so we have little to go from. So we have to rely upon these uh, methods uh, to infer, right? So at any rate, um, I say that some of them are pretty uh, impressive. You have uh, dendrochronology, right? The uh, um, timing by uh, tree ring, uh, measuring tree rings. Uh, you have, um, let's see here. Thank you, Dominic, for attending. Um, you have uh, radiocarbon dating, right, or C14 dating, uh, and uh, you have thermoluminescence dating, and that shows when a piece of pottery or something of that sort, had initially been heated how many years ago. Um, and then, of course, you have the uh, the sub-oceanic isotope analysis. I don't understand at all, but it's from where we infer the time of uh, ice ages. Okay? Uh, you have pollen analysis, uh, disease analysis, molecular and evolutionary bi biology, microsatellite analysis, and I really enjoy stratigraphy, uh, reading about it, obviously, not doing it in person. But um, through the, the, the laws of, of, of um, erosion, right, uh, different levels, uh, stratigraphic levels are stopped uh, by the, the stone, uh, by limestone, hard pan, something, you know, real durable like that. And when you look at the, that same level above that hard substance, and you, it has the same uh, mineral makeup, right? Like the same amount of, of uh, what is it, nitrogen and certain key components. Uh, they make the uh, conclusion that they were all contemporaneous. They were all the same time, okay? So uh, we, uh, for instance, we found a, um, a mastodon and he had an intelligently fluted uh, chert um, arrowhead uh, lodged in his rib cage, and then at the same stratigraphic level, we have some human bones. So we drew the conclusion, right? And also those human bones were found with hunting um, atlatls 
and those were the predecessor of the bow and arrow, et cetera, right? They had weapons. So we came to the conclusion that man uh, coexisted with what they call the megafauna uh, in the archaic age at the end of the ice age, and he hunted them. Uh, the the uh, woolly mammoth, saber tooth tiger, all of that. And we have found, you know, bones to those megafauna uh, at similar levels underground. Uh, so, excuse me? Yeah. Are you able to scroll down? I can't see the text. Oh, yeah. All right. Yeah, thank you. No problem. So what I do, right, is I say, granted, uh, some of these methods are are pretty impressive. They can be pretty impressive in providing a narrative of what happened and when, right? Then I, what I try to do, and then I, I go over uh, C. Vance Haynes' uh, thesis. And I know I'm old enough that that was accepted as just absolute truth, right? Is during the latest ice age, they believe the Wisconsin era, uh, they uh, through water displacement, uh, the Bering Sea emptied up and the Native Americans came from the Siberia uh uh, a uh, Eurasian area and crossed the Bering Sea by foot. And uh, there was room between, there's evidence of two major uh, glaciers. Uh, they call them the Laurentide and the Cordilleran. And um, they know that, right, from uh, big uh, scraping divots in the ground. And then they have formed lakes uh, subsequently. So at any rate, uh, they have evidence of those glaciers and there being a gap between them. So they call the gap the ice free corridor right, the, the walkway for these Native Americans, which all makes sense. But then, right, in the 1990s, uh, they came up with something that was supportive of this thesis, but then things that were not, okay? Uh, so for instance, the supportive data, they did, and of course, these people had to have been homogeneously Native American, right? Like no uh, inter-ethnic, uh, procreation in their past, but to be like bona fide Native Americans in the 1990s. And they took their mitochondrial DNA from their mother's line. And what they found were there are haplogroups and haplotypes that we have in our DNA. And some seem to be much more prevalent in some ethnicities than in others. And we believe that that, that you know, comes from inhabiting different continents and coming from different ancestors. But of course, all human. Uh, but um, but at any rate, uh, they contend that with these uh, Native Americans, they had the uh, very rare uh, GMAT and the Diego Allel uh, haplotypes, and that is found uh, prominently in people in Eurasia. So that does support uh, the thesis that they come from a Eurasian origin, and Native Americans don't like that because they think that we're trying to, that certain people with an agenda are trying to um, depict them as fellow immigrants, right? That they don't have a claim to the Americas, that they were just earlier immigrants than the rest of us. And so at any rate, it's con it's contested, but that's that's pretty, you know, impressive evidence. However, at uh, in Chile and in Brazil, uh, they found uh, human remains, with uh, man-made objects, uh, mainly like kind of kitchen type cooking objects and eating objects. And they they carbon dated them to 30,000 years ago. So, so much for us coming 13,000 years ago, if that is correctly uh, dated, right? 30,000 is a lot sooner. So then that's when they began to think, well, maybe they came through the Aleutian Islands in tool reed uh, boats. Uh, because the tool reed is biodegradable and they could just the boats could be gone by now and there'd be no evidence of them. But see, the, the thesis is in the air and I play on that ambiguity. OK, and then I show evidence of saying, right, that the. Um, the ice free corridor, there is very little evidence of a carbon footprint and a carbon footprint is proof of human habitation and human travel. Like they're gonna leave refuse, right? They're gonna leave uh, some who die, their bones. And very little is found in that corridor uh, for the masses of people that supposedly traveled through that narrow uh, gap. So that's tough on the thesis as well, all right? And then um, the tree rings, uh, you have anomalous rings, uh, sometimes missing rings, sometimes false rings. 
uh, uh, dendral chronology has a lot of holes in it. Okay, carbon fourteen. Uh, since the development of atomic ener energy, uh, the dropping of the atomic bombs in Japan, uh, that could have changed the amount of C14 in the atmosphere, the barometric pressure. And if those have changed, uh, C14 dating is not is not too reliable, according to uh, multiple scientists. So that that variable may have changed things and, and, and taken away and diminished uh, the power of C14 dating as a tool uh, to measure when something happened. And, and also with the wood, right? If they um, if they had older wood and they put newer wood on top of it, and um, and things like that, other types of variables, we could have a misleading dating uh, of the wood of the of the structures of the Native Americans. Okay, and so uh, what I do is I try to poke holes in these uh, these uh, methods and show how under certain circumstances they're not reliable. Uh, they won't yield uh, reliable data and give us an accurate narrative of what happened when with the Native Americans uh, prior to the European arrival. So because of that, I say that science can only get us so far and it cannot be relied upon to give us a definitive narrative of pre-Columbian Native history. So notice in my evaluation, okay, I'm stating that you shouldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater that many, many uh, conclusions derived from these methods have stood the test of time that have proven to be pretty accurate. And so just because under certain anomalous circumstances, some of the methods are faulty, we shouldn't throw them all out. And we shouldn't uh, conclude that science is inadequate, that, that perhaps we'll get to that day, uh, that we could fine tune these methods and, and, and have more certainty over the narrative that we form uh, as to what happened when with the natives. So notice the first part, all you're doing is showing what the thesis is, and you're given an example or two that was used by the writer to defend that thesis. So I see that you, you understood that. So there is kind of a right and wrong answer to the analysis, because there's a definitive message that I'm trying to convey in each one. And I wanna see that you see that. The evaluation is completely on you. OK, you uh, feel free to disagree with everything I write, because remember, it represents something that I've read, a lecture that I've heard. It's not necessarily well. It's not. It's not coming from me. OK, some of these I write, you know, tongue in cheek. OK, it's just I think they're, they're thought provoking, etc. So at any rate, going to the Native Americans, OK. To your first assignment. What I do here is if you notice. I'm very defensive of the native of the natives, right? If you've read it so far, I'm very defensive of the Native Americans and proving how quote civilized they are. But what we're doing is we're playing the Europeans game. We're playing the quote Western civilization game. This tends to be the criteria that the Europeans imposed upon the Native Americans, and that criteria has been. Uh, supported by anthropology, uh, anthropological books, right? When they uh, they go over the cultural evolution of different tribes, etc., they they kind of use this criteria as well, which may or may not be, you know, a uh, fair, accurate, etc. It, it's it's it could be just subjective, but these tend to be the criteria. Okay, uh, if you look at a book called Sapiens, okay, with that which was uh, it, it received some awards. And it goes over human cultural evolution, and it does, it goes through these right here, absolutely to a T, okay? So evidently, mankind was first in small bands and at the hunter-gatherer stage, and uh, all throughout the, uh, most of the archaic age, at the end of the ice, the latest ice age. And then in the pre-classic or formative era, uh, mankind finally started to create hybrid plants and grow them as crops. OK, and then supposedly it created domino effect. All right. So um, when you develop these crops, you're able to support by way of feeding uh, a much larger number of people. So now you get people to congregate in a village, in a town, OK, in some type of capital. Then with such mass cultivation of a crop or crops, plural, 
um, you need a direction, organization, and sometimes, sadly, even coercion. So you develop some type of autocratic ruler, right? Who uh, oftentimes connects his origin to one of the main gods of their pantheon in their religion and his right to be such. And then in directing that, right, uh, you have to worry about someone coming and attacking you at, during harvest time and stealing your crop. So you develop a military of some sort uh, for law and order and to protect uh, the crops from outsiders. And then from the vagaries of the weather and rain and sunshine, uh, the nutrients of the soil, many things that are outside your control, uh, you develop a religion and a class of religious, you know, kind of shaman who serve as like intermediaries between the humans of that uh, civilization uh, and the gods and the spirits who can control the rain and the wind and the sun and all that. And then from there, right, they kind of uh, kind of insinuate uh, Maslow's uh, hierarchy of needs that, you know, first you got to feel safe. You got to have uh, your basic needs met. You have to have safety and shelter. And then from there, you can live in a higher order. OK, uh, so then you have like, for instance, um, aesthetics, right? Uh, mankind's love for beauty. So you have people that differentiate themselves with uh, beautiful clothing, uh, jewelry. Uh, and then as well with that love for beauty is you supposedly develop kind of a, a literati and, and an artistic class. Uh, they engage in writing, poetry, literature. They write about their religious gods and different myths. Uh, they paint murals, uh, et cetera. Okay. And then... Um, from there, you also have artisans or skilled workers who create weapons, uh, uh, you know, different things to uh, to eat with and uh, furniture of some sort, uh, etc. Okay, you have your specialist uh, architects when you start building mass uh, mass architectural uh, edifices and so forth. So now you've developed complex society, uh, a society of multiple classes that are living together. And there's a sort of a hierarchy now. You're no longer a, a quote, a primitive egalitarian uh, society of everybody on equal footing hunting together, okay? And so you develop the arts and sciences, uh, you have technological growth. And of course the Native Americans don't stand a chance with religion because of course uh, the Europeans are gonna expect them not only to be monotheistic uh, belief in one God, uh, but they're going to want them to have believed in their monotheistic God, uh, the Trinity of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And of course, they haven't heard of that, so they don't stand a chance on that one. But in the other areas, right, the other four, uh, the fact that the Europeans, right, uh, depicted the Native Americans as primitive, childlike, you know, some of it, I think, emanated from their first experiences. Uh, Columbus, right? When he meets the tribes in the Caribbean, many of them were still not cultivating a crop. Uh, many of them were dressed in only loincloths or nothing at all. And so he likened them to like Adam and Eve before they in, in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. And they were like children, like a little child running around naked and doesn't know that he's naked or doesn't care. That they thought they were like in this childlike state of innocence. So they took a very uh, um, condescending uh, view toward the Native Americans in the Caribbean, the Arawak, the Taino uh, in particular, okay? And so uh, that characterization largely stuck, uh, despite the fact that they found some highly, uh, you know, um, dense, um, uh, uh, stratified, uh, you know, with a complex society, uh, places like the Mexica or the Aztec, in Tenochtitlan, in Mexico City. So at any rate, that notion stuck. And what I'm saying is, is that notion was just as convenient, or, or just as it was convenient, because, right, you could take a paternalistic stance and say, well, we're going to civilize them. And that gives you an excuse to colonize them uh, and, and make Christians out of them, etc. cetera. Uh, just as it was convenient, it was false. Okay, it was false. So what I do is I try to go through those first four requirements for civilized status and show how the Native Americans fared pretty darn well compared to the old world, 
All right. So the beginnings of farming. Uh, close. Look at here. Historian Alvin Josephy contends that South America boasted corn production as early as 3,500 years ago and cotton 5,000 years past. Or wait a minute. Right here. For instance, he contends that Sumer and the near in the Near East, right, Mesopotamia, easily predated other oral world sites and engaging in agriculture 11,000 years ago, while domestication of plants may have occurred in the Americas in Mexico as long as 10,000 years ago. So being separated by the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans, right, the Native Americans couldn't piggyback off of other civilizations like the Europeans could. The Europeans had Eurasia going into Asia, right? And so they could, they had the Near East and and uh, these other areas that they could they could piggyback off of, okay? As we get to Spain, you'll see uh, Spain was able to piggyback off of the, the Phoenicians of the Near East, uh, the North Africans, uh, the Romans, et cetera. All right. And so then the beginnings of like town and the beginnings of a, a, a complex society, uh, as early as 1800 BC, you had the Olmec, okay, uh, at um, La Venta and San Lorenzo, for instance. And they're the ones that have the big uh, stone heads, okay. And um, but they they began the calendar system, the writing system. Yes, it was hieroglyphic. It was pictographic instead of syllabic with letters, but it was still a writing system. Uh, their calendar system and writing system will be um, what they say perfected by the Maya at about 250 AD. Um, their knowledge of astronomy uh, was impressive. They could uh, predict lunar and solar eclipses, uh, et cetera. Uh, a lot of the uh, Mesoamerican religions were big on the bright morning star, uh, Venus, and they tracked uh, the movements of Venus uh, very faithfully. And then the Maya come in 250 AD, and they absolutely formed what would be considered a, a, a complex society. They had all the classes that I just mentioned. They had dense populations, the Patin, Palenque, Monte Alban, Tikal, okay? Uh, they had the... Um, uh, streets and uh, buildings that were lined up with uh, uh, constellations uh, and planets. They predicted lunar and solar eclipses. They had a 365-day calendar in addition to their 260-day uh, festival calendar. Uh, they took into account a uh, leap year. They um, th write that, that a year is actually 365 and a quarter days. Um, they uh, they also were finding they were a lot more warlike than we previously knew. Uh, there was a lot of fighting amongst the city-states of the Maya and also with outsiders. And they had outsiders at times come and take them over as well uh, from the Valley of Mexico. Another civilization, the Zapotec, are going to claim it centuries later, but we don't believe it was a Zapotec. We don't know who, uh, but uh, Teotihuacan. Uh, Teotihuacan is located in Mexico, and uh, this city right here, and um, it's called the city of the gods because they thought only the gods could have could have created it. It was created before Christ, and um, it's uh, again it's um, it has the famous uh, temple of the moon, temple of the sun, uh, Camino, the path of the dead, and um, just everything's lined up with uh, with uh, stellar and 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 planet bodies. Uh, again, their knowledge of mathematics and, and uh, astronomy was incredible. And all the way in the 1400s, the Aztec are going to claim lineage uh, from uh, not only the Toltec, who were impressive at a place called Toyan, or Tula, as the, the Europeans called it, but also back to Teotihuacan. All right, very impressive. And like I said, with the Maya, like for instance, right, uh, a line is five years, a dot is one. So if you have a line with three dots over it, that's eight years later. Um, and it goes from top up. And so the next uh, level, they'll have a number, maybe two lines and two dots, right? So that would be uh, uh, 12, five and five, and then two, it's 12. And then you multiply that 12 because it's in the second higher up level uh, by 20. 
And then the third level, you multiply it by 20 times 20 or by 400. So they're able to count to a super high number. Uh, also, their uh, their calendar was not only pictographic, but it was also syllabic uh, by syllables and sounds. And so that made it much more versatile and much more impressive to the Europeans. And then, of course, with the Aztec, uh, they had running water uh, and an aqueduct system. Uh, they had uh, zoos and libraries. They had hospitals. They had public schools. Uh, just incredible. Uh, when Hernan Cortes went into Tenochtitlan, his mouth dropped, and he pretty much said that Seville, Spain, had nothing on this city. Okay, paved streets, uh, drawbridges, etc. And then in present-day U.S. territory, uh, the first the narrative usually starts ironically in the arid Southwest, uh, with the pueblo, right, meaning city, the city people, because they develop pueblos. Okay. And uh, the Hohokam and the Anasazi are two uh, names given to some of the ancient people uh, in that area. And uh, if you just looked up Snake Town, Casa Grande, Chaco, Ca Chaco Canyon, Pueblo Bonito, these are very, very impressive remains. Uh, they had running water and irrigation. They had astronomically placed buildings. They had an astronomical observatory, uh, paved roads. Uh, mass um, farming, uh, a complex society of all classes, uh, merchants who engaged in very distant trade, okay, all there uh, in the Southwest. Now, the the um, the narrative may end up switching, however, because they keep finding uh, progressively more and more on the Adena, who they call the Adena, you see here in red. Uh, and they keep dating the Adena sites further and further chronologically back so that they may have predated the Pueblo. But they were up and down the Mississippi River, and they just they were known for just some some oddities. Uh, for instance, the height, the physical height of their leaders uh, buried. Uh, we're talking like like seven feet tall. Um, very anomalous. Uh, they found kilns, K-I-L-N-S, uh, and, and that's evidence of engaging in some type of metallurgy. And, you know, the, the Europeans thought they were the only ones uh, that had done that and that the European, that the natives had not. Now, granted, the, the, the natives mined uh, natural stones uh, like um, uh, turquoise and jade, uh, etc., but they did not make these artificial uh you know, metals like, like copper and iron, et cetera. But they're thinking that the Adena did, and they would be the exception uh, to the Native Americans not doing that. And also with Adena, like I said, they're, they're, uh, they are connected to the mound cultures uh, up and down the Mississippi, famous for their huge mounds, uh, which served like the pyramids of Mesoamerica as um, uh, kingly and aristocratic burial sites. And then they have mass burials for the commoners, and they obviously had large populations, multiple classes, uh, mass cultivation, irrigation, et cetera, okay? Uh, a writing system. In fact, the Adena, uh, a big symbol on the tombs of their leaders was the swastika, strangely, okay? And so then by 1200 AD, you had Cahokia in modern-day St. Louis, Missouri, and that was a, a real big place uh, as far as population and um and just the site itself, how much it spreads out. Now I'm going to wait on the Iroquois because I have a section on them. At least I believe so, although I might confine it to the uh, to the U.S. history class. We'll see if I put that in yours or not. Uh, then you have um, number three, native common traits that elicited harm. All right. Now, please understand on this one, OK? I am not justifying what happened. I'm not in agreement with what happened. Okay. I'm simply saying that it is what it is. It was what it was. It happened this way, however unfair that was. Okay. So please keep that in mind because I'll have some people evaluate it and say that it's arrogant to contend this and so forth. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm not saying it was a good thing. It just happened. Okay. So what I'm saying is, is for a few reasons, uh, the Euro colonizers uh, began to look down upon the Native Americans. 
and to, and to feel more entitled uh, to colonize them. Okay, so the first obvious one I put is religion to show how the religion of many of the Native American tribes was very, very uh, incompatible uh, with Christianity. All right. So I start off with the uh, more um, uh, dramatic cases. Right. So uh, going down to Mesoamerica and the Spaniards, uh, you have amongst the Aztec, you have a good twin and an evil twin and the patron god of the Aztec, which Potali was another name for Texcalipoca, who was the evil twin, okay, by, by their own estimation and their own pantheon of gods, all right? They were big on Quetzalcoatl, the, the good twin as well, and his ascension into the planet Venus as the bright morning star. Well, it just so happens in the book of Isaiah, uh, Lucifer is tied to the bright morning star and the planet Venus, so that did not help. Uh, the temple of which Pothli, uh was filled with snakes. And of course, that was symbolic of the devil in the Garden of Eden in the book of Genesis uh, to Hernan Cortez when Moctezuma II invited him into that temple. And then he said things to insult uh, Moctezuma and his, his god. Okay. Um, then you also have the cases of um, like in... Um, New Mexico, uh, with the at this time they were known as the Navajo in New Mexico by 1599. And when Don Juan de Oñate came, he brought with him uh, a contingent of Franciscan uh, missionaries, Franciscan friars. All right. And what they found is that the the Navajo religion was highly highly influenced by its need to placate the uh, fertility goddess uh, because they they uh, they had issues with their population with uh, actual fertility of children and, and and child deaths and they had issue with fertility of their crops because it was an arid dry region but in the midst of their their religious rights for fertility uh, they would actually engage in sexual acts and of course, to the, the Padres and the Friars, they're not going to abide by that, and they're not going to allow the natives to continue to do such. Uh, they, it would just clearly show to them how wrong the religion was of these natives. All right? And then with the shaman, uh, the idea that the shaman uh, could do acts of, um, uh, what is it, uh, augury, right? A-U-G-U-R-Y. Uh, where they would uh, take signs from birds, um, uh, uh, draw uh, draw sticks. Uh, um, sometimes they would take a hallucinogen and to get to an altered state because they believed that would get to the into the physical, the metaphysical uh, realm of where the the spirits of the ancestors and the gods resided. And to the European Christians, Catholics or Protestant. Uh, they felt like this was all very sinful, that it was, you know, that you don't use drugs, uh, you don't engage in anything that smacks of witchcraft or, uh, you know, tarot card type stuff. So with the shamanism, they weren't having that. They weren't impressed by that. They thought that, that also was of the devil. Then I go on to the second reason for which the Europeans came to look down upon the Native Americans, and that was a different concept of land ownership, all right? Uh, the Europeans felt like they had graduated uh, from the idea that you are merely using uh, the land that you're farming and inhabiting, but you don't technically, in the modern sense, own it. You're just using it, uh, because even to them, right, they believe that someone else um, owns it. And so that, of course, comes from feudalism, right? Um, but when as feudalism began to die by the early modern era, by the 1500s, uh, it, 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 it's, it begins the slow evolution toward capitalism and toward more modern concepts of private property, uh, access to buy and sell, uh, etc. Uh, no entitlement of lords to have... Um, vassals work for them on their land, etc. So then they develop a more modern notion of proprietorship, of actually being the proprietor, the owner of your own land. 
So when they come here to the Americas, they have misunderstandings, uh, whether it's the, the Dutch uh, with the, um, uh, what was it, the, not the Huron, the Canarsie uh, tribes, uh, the Dutch on the Manhattan Island of New York, uh, whether it was the uh, Powhatan in Virginia uh, with those of Jamestown, and of course, the uh, further down all the way to South America, you have many tribes who tell the, the the Europeans, "Okay, you could come, and yes, I I'll sign this. You you could you could inhabit this land, hunt on this land, farm on this land. Go ahead, take it, right?" But to them, right, uh, they a lot of them were pantheistic. They believe like there's a great spirit, and it connects everyone and everything. They believed, right, for instance, that animals have to surrender themselves to the hunters and allow themselves to be hunted and killed and so that they could feed selflessly uh, the humans, okay? And so the, the earth took on a, kind of a personification, like a, a living being, and it was the acme of, um, of arrogance for man to think that he could actually own a piece of the earth. To most of the native tribes so to the native tribes it was all about usufruct it was like hey you could exploit the land you could live on it for a while but you're not really like the the owner of that land no one's the owner of that land we're all going to die and return to that land and to the great spirit you know and so this was another reason for which the europeans began to look down upon the native americans and also take advantage of them was this different notion of property ownership all right. And then thirdly was that the Native Americans permitted the Europeans to take advantage of them in trade. Okay. Take advantage of them in trade. And really what I think this is a lot about is that what the Europeans considered valuable is still largely considered valuable today. And so, uh, you know, and, and probably because they made it so, because sadly they won, right? Uh, politically, economically, and socially, uh, they prevailed uh, here in the in North America. So at any rate, um, you know, the natives are like, okay, gold? Yeah, we make some trinkets out of it and so forth, but what's the use of gold? But we had a monetary value on gold. We found it in the Sabao region of Cuba, the Spaniards did, found it in... Um, uh, region of uh, Puerto Rico, and that started a war with the Taino. Um, we found it on the island of Española, where present Dominican Republic is. And um, of course, the Europeans went crazy for it. And the natives, they thought nothing of it. And they didn't understand what the big deal about the, about the gold was. And then also the natives had a sense, right, because a lot of the native tribes were, uh, were semi-nomadic, uh, like the Algonquin the Algonquin uh, natives on the East Coast, uh, they lived in three different areas in any given year. One area to uh, to harvest and to plant, one area to hunt, and I'm not sure about the third other area, I forget. But they normally, like I said, had three different places they called home every year. And so there was so much land to spare that they didn't feel a sense of urgency uh, in granting land encroachments by the Europeans coming from the coast. And so uh, at any rate, they didn't make high demands oftentimes, or they weren't able to make high demands because militarily they were they were outmatched. Uh, so they, they couldn't take advantage of of the um the good cards metaphorically, right? Like in a poker game. They had some good cards and they couldn't take advantage of them. So land, uh, mineral wealth, uh, also, um, their labor. There was a great scarcity of labor in most of the colonies throughout the first at least half century. And so uh, there was a great demand for their labor. And they just didn't, they didn't use those cards effectively. And so uh, you have areas like Pennsylvania, um, where else? Um, Connecticut, where whereby the political leaders start passing laws saying, you should not. You shall not take advantage of the natives uh, in trade, like with land, for instance. So in Connecticut and Pennsylvania, they made laws that you cannot make a private transaction for land from the natives because it was just assumed that the the paleface, the white man, 
was going to uh, cheat the native. And so what they would do is once or twice a year, uh, you'd have to come to a meeting, tell the leader of the natives and the leader of your own colony uh, what land you'd like to buy and get everyone's permission to do so. And supposedly all that was predicated by a knowledge of the colonial leaders that that the Europeans were just taking advantage of Native Americans with trade. All right. So for those three reasons, I'm saying uh, the 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 Europeans began to look down upon the Native Americans and to take advantage of the Native Americans. Okay. Now with the Iroquois, all right, uh, in present day New York, you had um, these uh, European chroniclers, right? And it was like they were trying to be early anthropologists. They would go and for a limited amount of time, they would live among the native tribes, okay? And then they would write something, their observations, right? And try to get them published into a book and they'd become really, really uh, coveted back in Europe because people had uh, this great uh, curiosity, like what are the native, what are the natives of that continent like, right? So they'd oftentimes become bestsellers. Well, with a guy named Vanderdonk, Adrian Vanderdonk, and a couple other Dutchmen that went in uh, as the Dutch first colonized New York, um, they lived amongst the Iroquois, and they give this impression right off the bat, all right? The Iroquois moved northward and they attacked their ancient enemy, the Huron, okay? They bring the Huron back and they would ask the old, they had a group of old sages that had a part in their Republican form of government. And a lot of the old sages were women. And they would ask in particular the elderly women, what do you want to do with these POWs, these prisoners of war? Some of them, the women would say, I want you to kill them. I want you to kill them right here and now. And they'd ceremonially kill them. And in some cases, if they were impressed by their prowess as fighters, uh, they would um, also cook and eat them. Okay. Uh, matter of fact, amongst the Iroquois, there were five nations in that confederacy. Uh, the Mohawk, their very name meant flesh eaters. So at any rate, they would cook them and eat them ceremonially. Uh, then uh, they would say, okay, what about these people? And a third of them, they would say, you know what? We want them to, um, to be adopted by us. So then they would forcefully adopt them into the tribe. And then the last part of the third, the last third, uh, they would say, you know what? They're, we're undecided on these. So they would make them run the gauntlet. Uh, there'd be uh, warriors in two lines facing each other in very close proximity to, to each other with just enough room, uh, shoulder room for someone to run in between them. They would be armed with their weapons and they would begin to proceed to attack the prisoner of war that ran between them. And if he could make it through the two lines, um, then he could be adopted. Uh, if he could not make it through the, the two lines, they would kill him right then and there. And he wasn't worthy of adoption. And that was known to Vanderdonk as running the gauntlet, okay? So he gives this information and highlights it. And uh, and then he also, uh, well, what he, he states is that after they defeated the Huron, they went and took over the St. Lawrence River so that they could provide the beaver pelts uh, to the Europeans, okay? So they're bullying the other native tribes uh, out of greed uh, so that they could be the ones to provide the beaver pelts uh, to the Europeans and get what they wanted from them, okay? So of course, what kind of depiction is, is rendered of them in Europe? They're, they're savages, right? And th those are usually the two simplistic caricatures of the Native Americans made by chroniclers of Europe, is that they were either childlike and innocent or they were savage and brutal, all right? But what I'm saying is they're a case in point that they were taken out of context. Like, you got to understand the whole context. Like, show the whole picture of this tribe. All right? So, firstly, right, the Huron were their ancient enemy. And they um, they were between the Dutch and the Iroquois. And they were keeping um, the, the Iroquois from being able to trade with the Dutch. All right? 
Well, that became a big deal when the Huron began to buy arms from the Dutch. The Dutch and the French were known to be willing to sell arms to the Native Americans. The English, no way. And the Spanish didn't want to either. So at any rate, the Huron, that gives them a huge edge over the Iroquois of having uh, these old uh, flintlock muskets. And so at any rate, the Huron felt like their days were numbered if they didn't make an act, if they didn't make uh, a move, okay? So then and only then uh, did they begin to attack the Huron, did they take control of the beaver trade uh, from the St. Lawrence River, and then of course in return they wanted guns for those beaver pelts uh, from the Europeans so they could hold their own with the Huron and other tribes that were getting such, all right? Then secondly, what oftentimes happened with those wars is uh, most of the time when they engaged in war, they were uh, mourning wars, uh, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, right? Uh, the white man's disease, for instance, came and wiped out the Iroquois. And so they lost a lot of farmers, a lot of warriors, etc. So they felt an acute need to, uh, to, uh, to uh, increase their numbers. So hence, in the midst of mourning, they would attack someone. Uh, mostly they tried to attack conventional, traditional enemies. They would attack them out of desperation uh, to bring in prisoners of war and, and, and to adopt most of them. So they could, they could come and, um, and fulfill much needed uh, positions in their society. And when they uh, were adopted, for instance, uh, they would be renamed uh, the name of, of, of beloved uh, dead ones who had passed, and they became like the living embodiment of a replacement uh, for them, all right? And as I mentioned already, they engaged in cannibalism because they believed that they were imbibing uh, the warrior quality of that person that they were eating, his remains, his legs mostly. Uh, they believed that they were imbibing his strength and his courage, etc., cetera, uh, by eating uh, parts of his 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 dead body, all right, and then also um, their um, their organization uh, was pretty impressive. Uh, they had, for instance, uh, what we would call like Rome and like us a republic. Uh, they had almost like a two house legislator. Uh, they had one house uh, of people that were directly elected by the people of the village. Okay, then the other house was of elders. Of, of older people, men and women, uh, who had uh, proven their wisdom, their loyalty to the tribe, et cetera, all right? Um, they also had uh, a way of trying to avoid violence, actually. Uh, it was known as the Great League of Peace. Uh, according to their legend, uh, there was a mysterious figure named Hiawatha who appeared uh, to one of their leaders uh, from the wilderness and gave him an idea of how to keep the peace. And what they and they began to implement it. And what they would do is that they would have uh, these meetings, however many times a year, I forget, and they would sit across from each other of a great fire, and they would begin by opening up and apologizing for any harm, any criminal activity, any injustice. Excuse uh, me? Yeah. Could you change the page down, please? Sure. Sure. Is that okay? I know a little bit further, I think. Right there. Right here? Yeah, I think so. Okay, no problem. Yeah, feel free anytime uh, to do that. All right. Um, so at any rate, they would um, they would apologize uh, on behalf of their constituents uh, for any wrong that had been done to another local leader of another clan, et cetera, right? And they would offer uh, in the form of wampum and other gifts uh, like compensation for the harm that had been done, especially if there had been a murder of any sort. And so, like I said, this is kind of like the German uh, Wehrgeld, right, uh, whereby you know, you kill my brother, so then I kill you, but then uh, then your brother kills me, and then my cousin kills you, uh, and it just keeps going on in this endless feud. They wanted to put nip that in the bud immediately, 
And so when someone's killed, someone's wrong, uh, they want to put a monetary value to that loss and a formal apology uh, to try to keep the cycle of bloodshed minimized. All right. So they did that amongst one another. Uh, they did it within their own tribes uh, amongst clans, one clan to the next, right? Extended family. Uh, they did it from um, one tri entire tribe to the other tribe because there were five of them in the Iroquois Confederacy. And of course, they even did it with their enemies and those that were not a part of the Iroquois Confederation. So, you know, they had, they 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 made, de you know, attempts to try to keep the peace. They were not always you know, uh, these bloodthirsty, uh, uh, military-oriented people. And then in addition to that, right, at the micro level, is people were impressed by um, their organization of reciprocity, of I take care of you and you take care of me. Um, instead of rugged individualism, uh, in a clan, you lived in the same uh, longhouse. And in that longhouse, uh, everyone did his or her part uh, to collect food and put it together in the collective cooking pot. And then everyone ate from the same pot. All right. And so you had common communal responsibilities and, um, you know, especially kind of left-wing historians like Howard Zinn, who's uh, like kind of a Marxist. He loves this stuff. He brags on it and shows how humane uh, the Iroquois were uh, to one another and, and their, their sense of reciprocity instead of, selfish individualism all right so at any rate i'm just trying to give examples right that um it it was not fair of these dutch chroniclers uh to give such a one-sided account and a superficial account of the iroquois that there was much more to them than that there was much more to the context the surrounding situation and circumstances uh than than what they put in their books all right and that's one more reason oops it's one more reason why we should all be very uh, leery if we get our hands on an old school uh, chronicle, okay? Because these people, um, they're coming with their own European worldview and their own biases. They're not even really trying to drop those biases, right? And they're judging the Iroquois uh, based upon their own uh, their own values, and the way that they were brought up. And then even those who were had good intentions, right? There's only, it, it, it's, it might be arguably impossible to become a truly objective observer of any other, quote, foreign culture and, and, and organization or foreign civilization, right? And not to mention, right, a lot of them had an ax to grind. They wanted to promote an image that was uh, conducive to the Europeans taking them over. All right. So are there any questions on that last one? Okay. So now I'm not going to, I'm going to be quick on this one. Okay. But because it's not due until, let's see here. It is due next Thursday. Uh, maybe I won't even do it then because we'll meet next Tuesday the 3rd, but then that only gives you two days to do it. So just I'm going to be very quick on this one. But with the Aztec assignment, look at these questions, okay? It says here, why should present-day Latinos be proud of their indigenous heritage? Or consider, compare and contrast Aztec society with contemporary American society. Or perhaps, how do you foresee early modern Spanish Catholic estimation of this Aztec society? So I'm kind of all over the place here. Remember the three categories that historians put history into are political, social, and economic. And I tried to hit all three of those categories, okay? And these come from the famous codices, okay? This first one right here is Codex Mendoza. Uh, there's Codex Ramirez. There's the Dresden Codex. Uh, there, there, there are quite a few on the Aztec. And they're named after the benefactors who paid to have them published. That's why they have European names to them. Okay. So you start off with a rags to riches story of the Aztec coming from Aztlan. 
And make note, right, that it, later on in the Chicano movement of the 1960s, they're going to use information of this codex to contend, right, that the United States, and particularly somewhere in the southwest of the United States, may have been the, the initial homeland of the Aztec. And the Chicano movement, they identified more with their Aztec heritage than they did with the Spanish heritage. Okay. So at any rate, look at this, ra this rags to riches story on number one. And then I get into their religion. Okay. And try to give some specifics about certain gods. But note, right? When you're reading about this, are they teaching any kind of lesson? So notice, right? Sir. Yeah. Are you showing it? I'm sorry? You on the screen? Oh, we don't see. I'm trying to get you on my other computer, but I don't oh. see what you're, you're talking. Are you showing what you're talking about? I am. Shoot. Let me try again. Thanks. No problem. Can you see it now? It's coming up. Okay, good. It's processing. It's loading up. Okay, I see good. it. Good, good. All right. So with this, for instance, right, I, I'm always thinking ahead of time, and I'm thinking about the Spanish colonizing the Aztec after they defeated them uh, in 1521. Um, the Aztec were big on humility. They were big on selfless sacrifice. Um, they were big on modesty, as you'll see. Uh, they were big on... Um, they, they had uh, sacraments involving confession of your sins and being truly contrite and sorrowful for those sins and then being told some act of penance to do for purification from those sins with the gods. That is going to be very, very uh, amenable to the Spanish taking them over, right? Because a lot of that is going to carry over into becoming Catholics. Let's see here. Uh, also, uh, human sacrifice, right? Uh, this guy right here. They contend that there was a very proud and vain God, okay? And and he and others uh, met in... Um, I was going to try to color it or something, but never mind. They uh, they they met in Teotihuacan, right? That's why they called it the City of the Gods. Uh, the gods supposedly came down there themselves, right? And they believe that uh, the gods uh, four different times have created, and then one of the rival gods destroyed that creation, that we're living under the fifth creation of the gods uh, right now. So at any rate, after the fourth destruction, um, you have these gods meet at Teotihuacan, and one of them, I wish I could remember his name, was a very proud and vain god. And they offered a fire, and they said, okay, which one of you gods is willing to go and stand in the fire and be consumed by it so that uh, you could become the sun and provide sustenance to these new humans? And the proud, vain god wouldn't do it. And up steps a disabled, um, they, they say that he was homely and, and, and had lots of acne, uh, this very unassuming God uh, and humble God, Nana Watsin, without hesitation, walks into that fire. And then he ascends and becomes the sun. And he says that he will only do his natural course in the universe of providing sustenance for humans if they show themselves equally willing to shed their own blood and sacrifice their own lives. So hence, right, there's there's almost a, a semi-virtuous um, rationale and foundation uh, for their seemingly barbaric practice of human sacrifice. And by the way, like the the similarities with the uh, with the, the Spanish Catholics, 
They believed there were 13 levels of heaven, nine levels of hell, and that there was something pretty much equivalent to a purgatory. They called it Miklan, the underworld. And of course, the, the Maya called it Shabalba. And then, of course, yes, they were um, very militaristic, right? It says, perhaps owing to Aztec high regard for courage, sacrifice, and acknowledgement of the fact that life entails a duality of vice and virtue, the Aztec believed that soldiers killed in battle, women who had lost their lives giving birth to children, it was interpreted as having been killed by a warrior child in the womb, and sacrificial victims ascended to the high sun heaven after death. All right. Then I write about the sophistication of their calendar that they got from the Maya. Not too shabby. And then on this one, this one's meant to elicit compassion over human sacrifice. Uh, they are uh, giving their 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 children over to Tlaloc, their rain god, uh, because they believed it had to be done in order to receive rain. But it says all the while while they're doing it, everyone is weeping, crying, mourning. But again, that, that, that you know some of the similarities remind me a little bit of the Japanese. Uh, it th there's a lot of um, a need for um, public virtue. Uh, selfless sacrifice. Uh, do not bring shame at any level to your own family and to your own name. Uh, you know, uh, so at any rate, uh, they, uh, as you see here, written by Saul Goon, a, 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 a priest, a Catholic priest, he says, right, the blame for this should be imputed on Satan for blinding them into thinking they had to do such an awful thing. And then for my Spanish speakers, that's what it is in Spanish. And look what I put here with Aztec morality. I put syncretism. And remember, that is uh, two different parties, two different civilizations borrowing from each other. It not being a one-way streak. Okay. And look what the Spaniard Sagun wrote. Virtuous Aztecs are obedient and honest, treating their fellows with respect and showing discretion in their dealings with others. Virtuous men and women work hard, whether in the fields, at their sewing, preparing food, in an artisan's workshop, or in the marketplace. They bring energy to their work without overindulging in sleep, but rising early and laboring for long hours. They eat and drink in moderation. Drunkenness is particularly frowned upon. They do not make a great noise when eating, think carefully before speaking, and are circumspect, circumspect and what they say, they dress and behave with modesty. Children are raised to understand and follow this code. All right. But notice there's kind of like stoicism. Uh, if you've read like um, Marcus Aurelius, his meditations, and some of the other Stoics, uh, uh, the, the Romans in the first few centuries AD, uh, right? They contend that, you know, basically life is in many ways terrible and tragic, uh, but it's all about your ability uh, to become like a, uh, a brick wall that everything bounces off. Uh, expect the worst. Uh, uh, you have to give your permission uh, uh, intellectually and emotionally uh, to let things bother you, uh, right? Whether it be the rudeness of other people or some injustice done to you, just expect it. Don't think anything of it. Don't take it personally. Don't let yourself get worked up and, and upset, et cetera. You see that kind of stoicism with the Aztec, too. Thus she told him, a baby boy, that it, life, was all affliction, travail, that would befall him on earth, and that he would die in war or would die in sacrifice to the gods. So they were prepared for the worst. And, of course, this is exacerbated, right, by um, there is a, a writing of um, the, the auguries of the Aztec. I'm trying to remember what Spaniard printed it. Uh, but at any rate, I wonder if it was Vasco de Quiroga. I can't recall. 
but I could figure that out before next time. But matter of fact, I have it somewhere in my bookcase. But at any rate, uh, they 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 believe they were receiving lots of um, of clues and signs uh, from the heavens uh, that trouble was coming, right? Uh, when the Spanish, you know, uh, fulfilled that trouble uh, coming and conquering them. And uh, supposedly a lot of anomalous or out of the ordinary things began to happen. They had like a solar eclipse. Uh, they had uh, uh, things with birds uh, uh, two or three times with the with the with the emperor. Um, not to mention the uh, the alleged prophecy of of Quetzalcoatl. Uh, there was a Toltec from Tuyan uh, who was a prince, and he took on the name Quetzalcoatl of his favorite god, and he was chased out of Tuyan. Uh, and this was like the 600s. At any rate, he said in a certain number of bundles, because you have a 52-year bundle with the, with the uh, with all the possible combinations of three-part combinations with their calendar, and then it starts over. Um, he said in certain number of bundles uh, in the year, I think it was one read, uh, that he would come back uh, from uh, the east, and he'd come back to take his his own uh, to take in his own people and to conquer his enemies and uh supposedly that one year read after so many 52 year cycles was somehow crazily 1519 the very year the spaniards came so there was a lot of sense of like a uh, fatalism amongst the aztec like you know life is awful that we, we can't stop it all right so uh a ruler admonishes his son that it is the weeper, the sorrower, who secures the compassion of the Lord of the near and of the night. A noble warns his daughter that the world is a difficult place where one has caused pain and affliction is known. Rulers and noblemen advise their sons to seek the humble life as their honored forebears had, saying more than they were honored, the more they were wet, wept, suffered affliction, sighed, they become most humble, most meek, most contrite. Okay, so... When you see that, right, Sagun loved that as a Spanish priest, because what did that remind him of? That reminded him of Jesus's uh, sermon of the Beatitudes. Blessed are the humble, blessed are the meek, blessed are those who weep now, right? There's just some crazy, uh, you know, uh, compatibility, uh, despite the, the obvious warfare between these two civilizations, All right, their children could not be incorrigible, negligent, or idle or lazy, and they had ways of punishing their children. Um, a girl was supposed to keep her virginity until marriage, and boys were equally uh, urged to do so. Again, with shame, if you had done something of great shame to humiliate your family, they cut your hair. And that was considered a great insult. Lying, theft, treason, right? So much compatibility with the Spanish mores, with their, with their value system. Judges were told they would be uh, removed and punished if they showed partiality to the rich or to anyone over another person, but always to be impartial. Uh, the socioeconomic way up uh, for the Aztec was in the army or in the church. And what do you know? Those are the same two main avenues up in Spanish society, the army or the church. Oh. And then, yes, again, going back to their martial culture is yes, it is true uh, that the, uh, the Aztec leader, now he was supposed to be uh, a renaissance man, okay? Literally, the name uh, uh, Tlatelone, uh, his title, was he who speaks. They wanted him to be a great orator, a great speaker. They wanted him well-versed in the codices. They wanted him to be a good artist and writer, etc. cetera, okay? Uh, but then also, as soon as he was or ordained as the king or the emperor uh, of the Mexica or the Aztec, um, he would be demanded to immediately go on a military campaign and bring back triumphantly uh, prisoners of war to show that he's worthy of being their emperor. 
So yes, they were uh, a military-oriented society. And the hierarchical system, right? Here's where you have to remember, okay, is where you see a little bit of inequity. Remember, inequity is that it, it, it's kind of unfair, that there's like a an aristocracy. Remember, aristoi means the best in Greek, so the group of the so-called best, and they get certain privileges that the commoners don't get. Uh, the Spaniards were actually, they, they were impressed by that. Because today, right, in our rhetoric, we're much more egalitarian. Everyone's on equal footing. There's equality amongst all, et cetera. It wasn't like that in the early Middle Ages, in the I mean, early modern era of the 15 and 1600s. Uh, this was impressive to the Spanish that they had this strict hierarchy. So you had two separate school systems, uh, one for the, the nobility and one for the commoners. Uh, Popoli were the nobility and uh, Malkakak were the commoners. Um, and then you also have um, what's interesting is uh, stricter and harsher punishment for the nobility uh, committing the same crimes as the commoners, okay? Uh, because uh, they were expected, they had higher expectations for the nobility. They're supposed to behave in a manner much more uh, in, in tune with self-respect and virtue than the commoners were. And also they had a sense of noblesse oblige, right? The nobleman's obligation is that the nobility were expected to take care of those who could not take care of themselves. Let's see here. A matchmaker is sought by the prospective groom's parents to ask the young woman's mother and father for their daughter's hand in marriage. This process often entailed up to four visits, as the pictograph illustrates the bride-to-be parent's concern of how well the husband will treat her. If successful, the matchmaker carries her to her uh, groom's house with the priest's approval and the date set uh, with much food. And what's interesting also, right, is they could do a trial run and have... Uh, for, uh, I should have put that in here, uh, have for uh, a certain period of time, the would-be groom stay in the house of the would-be bride. And so that the mother-in-law and the prospective father-in-law could really get a better picture of what kind of young man this is. All right. And what's interesting is when you read books on Latino culture, this throughout the 18 and up into the beginning of the 1900s, was followed still in Mexico, that it was very common for a young man to get his older brother or his father uh, to come to and leave something on the porch of the would-be uh, wife. And then they responded. Uh, sometimes it was in the form of a pumpkin, and they would either squash it or not on their porch. And then they would take the next step and ask if he could come and stay with them. And then if he could stay with them and they were still impressed, then they would consider granting permission of their daughter to marry him. And so a lot of that, you know, I, I see right here in number five, uh, carried over, uh, not necessarily from the Spanish, but from the Aztec. here anything else i want to talk about so the uh the the emperor that word right there that's lot teoni uh he who speaks uh ruled city states and was responsible for the following uh warfare death in the city singing dancing religious rights and payments guarding the market patronage power to a point contending with famine or plague sanitation and sports okay chosen by an elder council of nobles related to the previous emperor uh, the newly installed Tlatloni had to humble himself in acts of public penance before celebrating his ascension. Right. The slaves did not inherit their status. Often a master bought a would-be slave's debts and paid him her enough to live off of for up to a year. 
Subsequently, the poor recipients of the loan worked it off in service after an initiation rite was carried out with four witnesses. That sounds a lot like the old Roman form of, of slavery. So that's not as nearly as severe as the you know, African-American slavery uh, that the Spaniards and the English uh, put, put the slaves in. And then also slaves were those caught by the Pochteca. Uh, like if you've seen that very dramatic movie, uh, Apocalypto, uh, the people that came and attacked that village and took the prisoners, uh, they were the Pochteca, uh, the armed warrior merchants, uh, whose job it was to go and catch prisoners of war and bring them back to be sold uh, either as slaves and those that weren't bought uh, were sent to be sacrificed. But again, self-abnegation, denying yourself and piety. To me, it's just crazy. Uh, some of the similarities, you know, because you think of the first thing you think of is like human sacrifice. And you think of the vast differences between the Aztec and the Spaniards. But to me, when I read this information, uh, this comes from about three, I think. I think I used uh, three codices uh, to come up with all this information. And when I put this together... I, I became much more impressed by the similarities. That's just me. Right. Hmm. And, and then just a, a last little note, uh, that last sentence or second to last sentence, people like the Tlaxcalans were habitually attacked by the Aztec army, the prisoners likely to die as sacrificial victims, while many villages and cities were subject to be burnt to the ground. This created a source of potential allies later for the Spaniards. Uh, the Tlaxcalans supposedly sent tens of thousands of warriors to fight with the Spaniards against their hated enemy, the Aztec. So the Spaniards are going to utilize the divide and conquer tactic against the Aztec. All right. So I gave you three questions up at the very top to think about. But really, I, I won't care if you go your own direction and you don't address any of the three. I'm just trying to get your wheels turning. All right. So like I said, why should present-day Latinos be proud of their indigenous heritage, compare and contrast Aztec society with contemporary American society, or you can compare and contrast Aztec society with Spanish society? Uh, how do you foresee early modern Spanish Catholics, how they're going to estimate all this? Uh, if you want to go your own direction, if this gives you another idea, another theme comes to your head as you read all this, by all means, just go with it. All I want you to do is to synthesize some of this material into some type of an intelligent point that you're making. All right. But yeah, I just, I can't tell you how fascinating, how much I love these codices. They're so cool. And just thank God uh, that, that people like Bernardino de Sagun, that Spanish priest, uh, got these young Aztec noble boys who knew all the meanings of all the hieroglyphics uh, to write them out in Spanish so that future generations could know what they meant. Because, of course, in the original codices, they're all pictures. All right, so you guys doing okay? Do you guys feel pretty well about these first two assignments? Yeah. Good. I hope so. I hope so. I haven't had a, I haven't really had a ch chance to um, read your uh, example for the first one. Sure. And I guess I've been out of I guess I've been out of school long enough to where I, I'm going to have to really read that and check it out to see how you want to be argumentative against something that's been notarized that's been put into a book, you know. <laughs> Sure, but, sure. Uh, they spent their time and the research on it and made it, it, you know, 
Yeah. So that's true. How are you supposed to argue that? I guess I'll figure it out. Yeah, I I I have faith. Give me an Dominic. example. I'm sorry. Example. It, is there like an an example you could give me? Yeah. Um. Uh. Like or I said, is, it, is that so? Um. The example that I was giving, right, is that. Oh shoot. Hopefully he makes it back. Darn it. Uh, can, I that, can I see that the first example, but the first assignment one? Uh huh. Yeah, so uh, assignment one, number one, that's that's the only one that I've actually written out an example uh, response. I can see it. Yeah. So, yeah, take a look at number one, uh, read it for yourself, and see how. Uh, how my uh, my response relates to it. Hi, Dominic. I got I got kicked out. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so remember the the example I was given, Dominic, was that um that I see room for when the Spanish take over the Aztec. I see a lot of parallels, a lot of similarities in their values and in some of their beliefs. That's going to make coexistence more easy. That's uh, perhaps more more smooth, right? I mean, they had they they had a, a value system of of humility, selfless sacrifice, uh, being sorry for your sins, uh, a notion of heaven and hell, uh, a notion of the noblemen having it better than the commoners. So hence, they better use that power for good and protect the commoners and do well for the commoners. Um, they were very proud of their military prowess. The Spaniards were very proud of their military prowess. Um, yeah, so, and matter of fact, if you wanna look ahead, look at the Spanish colonizer and see what I write about the Spanish uh, to get an idea um, you know, of, of comparison. But to me, I see, like I said, on, on, on the surface, they could not have been more different. But when I read this information and put it together from uh, about three codices, uh, I'm seeing a lot of similarities uh, that I'm impressed okay. by. And to me, I think that's going to make their coexistence go more smoothly in the future. Okay. So I'll, I mean, to, I'll, to I'll me, that I'll... argument, that, as simple as that argument is, that's good enough for me. Okay. Very good. All right. Well, I'm glad you made it back. Um, uh, any Thanks. other any other questions before we uh, we we go ahead and break off? All right. So you guys feel okay with the first two assignments? Uh, you know, so can I see the example for the first one, like how you made the evaluation? Yeah. 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 Here. Let's see here. Sample. See, I say section one of the Native American handout states that modern science, and I quote myself, can only get us so far in formulating an historical narrative of what happened when. The section begins by granting a concession to the opposing argument that methods like C-14 dating, digital chronology, thermal luminescence dating, stratigraphy, and isotope analysis shed light in forming an historical narrative. It then, however, provokes skepticism of such methods showing their limitations and citing exceptional circumstances in which those methods will fail to yield definitive information. For instance, I give examples. It states that dendrochronology will not work with complacent trees, that carbon-14 dating will not provide an accurate chronology if the amount of C-14 in the atmosphere has changed. Uh, the primary piece of evidence used to diminish confidence in modern science's capacity to create a narrative, however, is in refuting C. Vance Haynes' thesis of Native Americans migrating from the steppes of Asia during the latest ice age just 13,000 years ago. The writer discourages trust in Haynes' scientifically derived theory by way of, via, citation of two carbon dated sites in South America prior to his timetable, and by way of stressing the scarcity of evidence for ancient humans having traveled through the ice free corridor. All right. So all I did was cite my own thesis and a couple examples of 
that were used to support that thesis. Then I tear into it. See what I say? The writer cites his or her facts relatively faithfully and uses examples in support of his or her thesis that science cannot provide a definitive historical record. However, highlighting limitations and out of the ordinary cases of scientists' previous findings proving wrong does not merit an overhaul of all methods as permanently incapable of discerning truth. Future advances in knowledge and technology may render a clear sight into the ancient past achievable as there must exist plenty of hypotheses garnered from those methods that have indeed passed the test of time already. That Haynes' theory may presently appear implausible and that many methods do not yield trustworthy data under all circumstances should not discourage fine-tuning those methods we have and discovering future means to continue our aim for definitive acquisition of ancient truths. So you see what I did? I, yes, I, yes. I, I cited the thesis. I gave two or so examples of how that thesis was supported. And then I gave my own take as to what I think was wrong with that thesis. All right. So any other any other questions? I promise this will become easy soon. It's just different. It's my own quirky, you know, uh, pedagogy, my own teaching style. But I promise once you do two or three of these, it, it's going to become easy. You're going to get used to it. All right. Well, I'm glad to have you guys. All right. Good luck with this. And especially you guys on the first couple of assignments. I'm going to be I'm going to be easy on everybody. I know it's a new it's new this my own quirky style is new to everybody and I, I'm aware of that. And so you just just try, just try your best. That's all you could do and I'll I'll give you my two cents if I, I feel like it's missing something that I'm really wanting to see. Okay? Very good. Thank you. All right, yeah. thank you Dominic. Thank you for coming. Uh, so deep. I appreciate both of you. All right? So you guys have a good day and a good week, okay? And I hope to see you next Tuesday. Sounds yeah. good. Thanks. All right, you guys take care.